Very good afternoon to all respected seniors and dear friends of our esteemed IMF faculty uh, who have joined us for the first session of day three of IMS CGP first online conference of 2021. I welcome you all. <clears throat> the first topic involves obesity, which has reached an epidemic proportion with the prevalence of obesity increasing up to 35 to 40 percent in male and female population respectively. We are aware that about 200 of adverse health-related outcomes are associated with obesity. They include uh, adverse cardiovascular mobility, uh, uh, diabetes mellitus, lipid abnormalities, and of course, increase in all-cause mortality. The treatment uh, spectrum of this uh, epidemic, the obesity, include the uh, lifestyle modifications, the pharmacological agents, and of course, a very well-established surgical option. Now, today, the first session, we uh, introduce pediatric endoscopy, which, an, which is an evolving field generated to combat this epidemic through so minimally Yeah, Piyush, we can't hear you.
गौरव गौरव प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ गौरव गौरव प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ कांट हियर यू Good evening, one and all. So today, for the first lecture, we have Dr. Vikas Singhla, who is the director of gastroenterology and endoscopy at Max Hospital, Sakhi, and he is a very eminent endoscopist, a renowned endoscopist all over the India as well as the world. And uh, he has his field of interest, uh, as he keep on meeting also his field of interest is advanced endoscopy, usually endoscopy ultrasound, third space endoscopy, as well as his Also, other fields of interest are ulcerative colitis, and so I hand over the mic to Dr. Vikas Singhla to start. Yeah, uh, uh, very uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Gaurav, uh, for the kind words. I'm thankful to the organizing committee and especially Dr. Piyush uh, for the uh, kind invitation. So, as asked, I will be uh, uh, discussing a, a very important topic of endo uh, bariatrics. So, as we all know, Goro, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. And we can see the slides also. Yes, sir. Yes. So, uh, uh, we can see that uh, the prevalence of obesity is increasing. In fact, it has increased significantly, and uh, the complication related to the obesity has also increased. Obesity can lead to diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea. osteoarthritis coronary artery disease and various types of malignancies so in any case of obesity lifestyle modification and the pharmacotherapy are the initial treatment but they have very limited uh, response for a given patient and surgery has the maximum and the durable uh, response so how much weight loss is desirable in a given patient uh, it has been seen that with the weight loss reduction of 10% there can be significant reduction in mortality in diabetic patients and with this weight loss there is also a significant effect on the lipid level also and it can further lead to reduction in the risk of malignancy and it also controls the hypertension so uh, this pyramid shows how we treat the uh, obesity so each and every patient is offered the lifestyle Modifi uh, modification uh, we advise limited uh, calorie intake and increase physical activity and pharmacotherapy is used in the uh, selected patients and uh, they have limited efficacy on the other hand surgery is offered to few patients but ha it has a maximum efficacy and now uh, there is a new domain of bariatric endoscopy in between the surgery and the pharmacotherapy so uh, in this picture on the x axis is the complication and on the y axis is the efficacy for the procedure such as lifestyle modification and the medication the efficacy is limited but complication are also limited there are no significant complication of pharmacotherapy or the lifestyle modification on the other hand with the surgery there is high efficacy but there is also increased risk of complication so i think the risk of complication after surgery is around 1 to 2% and remember the obesity surgery are mostly cosmetic surgery or they are the non urgent surgery okay uh, so the complication here is not acceptable by the patient or the family so they always have a fear of complication after the uh, surgical procedures so there is a unmet need so can the uh, bariatric endoscopy uh, can the bariatric endoscopy fill that gap between the surgery and the pharmacotherapy so uh, with the endoscopy we can do uh, various interventions uh, first first are the gastric intervention and they have evolved significantly so we have two options either we can place a balloon inside the stomach or we can apply sutures inside the stomach and then there are small bowel interventions so i will be discussing these one by one so first <laughs> intravenous mention is the uh, intragastric uh, balloon placement so across the globe this is the most popular endobariatric uh, treatment and it requires a team uh, we need a nutritionist we need a psychologist we need a endoscopist so it's a, a combined approach 
so uh, whenever a patient comes to us for the balloon placement balloon is kept from 6 months to 12 months and uh, there is always a time lag between the opd visit and the balloon placement so during the first two weeks patient is started on the uh, proton pump inhibitor and the anti emetics and the diet modification so that will help in better tolerating the balloon if we don't wait for two weeks without starting the ppi or anti emetics we place the balloon directly the patient can have significant nausea vomiting and significant pain and the patient may request for the removal of balloon so there may be uh, poor tolerance to the balloon if we don't have a cooling period before placing the balloon so uh, what are the indication uh, the balloon is placed for the uh, age between 18 to 70 years bmi should be between 32 kg per meter square and uh, always the conventional treatment such as exercise and the uh, limited calorie intake should be attempted only after the failure of conventional uh, treatment balloon should be offered so uh, the exclusion criteria are the prior gastric surgery and the large hypotonia the prior gastric surgery especially for the gerd or the hypotonia they predispose to uh, they can lead to gastric perforation or they will increase the grd after surgery if the patient has uh, esophageal or gastric varices or the severe portal hypertensive gastropathy many time obese patient can develop cirrhosis and the cirrhosis can lead to portal hypertensive gastropathy and the esophageal or gastric varices so these are the contraindication to balloon placement after that there can be variceal bleed or there can be ooze from the phg or if there is a oropharyngeal obstruction this will uh, the, then we cannot pass the endoscope and it will be not feasible to place a balloon partial or complete esophageal obstruction like due to tumor or the ecclesia cardia again is a contraindication to the balloon placement and uh, of course gastric malignancy is a contraindication to the intragastric balloon placement so uh, placing a balloon is a very uh, simple procedure uh, it doesn't require uh, any skills it's a require basic endoscopic skills so we need a standard endoscope and then the along the and endoscope we attach the deflated balloon so along with the balloon the endoscope is passed inside the uh, stomach then we fill the balloon with the saline we fill the balloon with the 500 to 750 ml of saline and saline is stained with the methylene blue there is a purpose of staining the saline with the methylene blue if there is a rupture of the balloon the methylene blue will be absorbed in the blood and the patient will pass the uh, blue colored or the green colored urine and patient will come to know that balloon has ruptured and after 6 uh, months to 1 year we can remove the balloon and uh, after the balloon uh, for initial 2 days only clear liquids are allowed and after 3 to 14 days 1000 kilo calorie diet is allowed and during this two weeks there is a rapid weight loss for the patient and during 15 to 21 day we allow the soft diet and 1200 kilo calorie and after 21 days patient can resume the normal diet so uh, uh, this diet is not feasible without placing a balloon because this will not lead to early striety so what the balloon does once there is a intragastric balloon with a 500 ml of volume this will be leading to early striety so with the limited calorie intake the patient will have early striety if the patient can follow this diet without the balloon this will lead to equal weight loss but it's it's not feasible to follow this diet uh, without any intragastric device because of poor striety so the first generation balloon uh, was of polyurethane and there was a risk of spontaneous deflation and a gastric ulcer or perforation now they went out of work and the new generation balloon are silicon based balloon they are made of sil uh, silicon and they can be filled with the either saline or they can be filled with the air and uh, we have various balloon available in india we have orbera balloon <coughs> and the spats balloon orbera is a non adjustable balloon and spats is a adjustable balloon with the spats balloon we have a attached catheter so we can increase or decrease the volume of the balloon 
so uh, this was uh, so this is the orbera balloon uh, there is no this is a, there is no catheter attached to it so we cannot change the volume of the balloon and we can fill the balloon from 500 to 750 ml of saline and it has to be by, placed by endoscopy and it has to be kept for the 6 months and after 6 months patient will require another endoscopy for the balloon deflation and the removal so this patient will require two endoscopy one for the placing the balloon and another for the removing the balloon and in a large study of 2500 patient from the europe uh, between 2002 2004 uh, the balloon was placed in 2500 patients and the mean excess weight was 59.5 kg and uh, after placement of balloon two patient had acute gastric dilatation and after 6 months uh the mean weight loss was 10 10% of total body weight and the mean bmi loss was 5 kg per meter square and there was significant improvement in the comorbidity and like diabetes or hypertension they resolved in 44% of patient or they improved in 44% and they were unchanged in 10% so we can see that after the weight loss there is a significant improvement in the diabetes and the hypertension and overall complication was 2.8% and per gastric perforation occurred in the five patient and we can see that out of five perforation four perforation occur who had undergone previous gastric surgery and most of the surgery were done uh, were performed for the gerd and 19 patient had uh, gastric obstruction and they required the balloon removal the patient had significant pain and the vomiting nine patient had the balloon rupture which was removed by the endoscopic removal other complication were the esophagitis and the gastric ulceration and we can see that there is significant improvement we can see the hypertension resolved in 44% of patient similarly the diabetes resolved in 32% of patient and similarly there was improvement in the obstructive sleep apnea osteoarthritis and the dyslipidemia there was complete resolution or improvement across various comorbidities another balloon is the spats balloon so if you compare this balloon with the uh, orbera balloon it, it has a extra catheter attached to the balloon so this is a adjustable balloon so if the patient ha- doesn't have the desired weight loss we can pu- pull the cath- we can do the endoscopy again and we can pull the catheter or then we can either increase the volume or we can decrease the volume if the patient has vomiting or the pain we can decrease the volume and if there is no desired weight loss we can increase the volume of the balloon and this balloon can be kept for up to one year so in a study of 165 patient with the mean mean bmi of 35.7 the mean weight loss was 16 kg and uh, uh, there was down adjustment was required in 20 patients and after the down adjustment out of 20 16 patient could continue the balloon and up adjustment was required in 64 patients and after the up adjustment the patient had another weight loss of 5.7 kg one patient had gastric perforation out of 165 and uh, with the balloon uh, there is a problem of weight regain as you know that we can we have to keep the balloon for other 6 to 12 months so once we remove the balloon we can see that there can be a weight gain again so uh, the final weight at the time of removal was 91 and we can say it start increasing after 6 months same but at the end of one year there was 10 kg weight gain and after the after the 5 uh, years there was a weight gain of 20 kg so balloon is a temporary method and there can be a weight regain once we remove the balloon and uh, the future will be the uh, ellipse balloon uh, we have seen that for the orbera or the spats balloon we require endoscopy twice one for placing the balloon and another for the removing the balloon for the ellipse balloon no endoscopy is required patient swallows the capsule in the opd patient will swallow a capsule which has a attached catheter to it then we do the fluoroscopy or x ray and we confirm that capsule has reached the stomach then we can inflate the balloon with the saline and the moment it's a filled with the 500 ml of water the catheter will detach from the balloon and after four months there will be spontaneous deflation of the balloon and the balloon will pass in the fecal matter so ellipse will be a endoscopy less balloon 
Another uh, endoscopic method which is targeted at the stomach is the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. So uh, it's a transoral endoscopic technique which will lead to reduction in the gastric volume. So during ESG, we apply multiple sutures inside the stomach that leads to reduce gastric capacity. And we take multiple full thickness sutures in the stomach. We start from the antrum and we go up to the G junction. And this required double channel gastroscope. The indication are BMI more than 40 kg per meter square or BMI 35 with the comorbidity like diabetes, hypertension, osteoarthritis, or OSA. And the contraindication are bleeding disorder, PT prolongation by more than four seconds, the thrombocytopenia, patient having active peptic ulceration, large hydrocernia, family stereogastric cancer, or the act or the gastric cancer. These are the contraindication for. ESG. So we can. So this is the technique of endoscopic uh, sleeve gastroplasty. So this is the Apollo uh, device, and uh, we can see that this is the anchor, and this is the helix. The helix goes inside the gastric wall. With that, then we pull the helix; it will pull the gastric wall inside, and then there will be needle exchange between the two sides. On one side. Is a needle holder and other size is the anchor. So needle will be exchanged be between the needle holder and the anchor device. And we can see that uh, uh, during the ESG procedure, we apply multiple sutures in the gastric wall. Then we tighten the suture. So this is the helix. So helix will go inside the. We rotate the helix. We first touch the helix with the gastric wall. Then we rotate. So then we pull the gastric wall. So this will take full thickness bite. And then we are exchanging the needle. So needle will go from one side to other side. So that way we are piercing the gastric wall. It's a full thickness gastric, uh, full thickness suture. That way we apply multiple suture. And we can see the incisura. We start from the anterior gastric wall. Then we go along the greater curve. Then we go up to the posterior gastric wall. We can see that we are again taking multiple bites. So with the one suture, we take around six to eight bites. So uh, from the antrum to the G junction, we apply four to six suture, depending on the gastric size. And after applying the suture, the capacity of the stomach will be reduced and patient will have early striety. We can see here, this is the crumpled stomach along the anterior wall. This is the anterior wall. This is the greater curve and that's the posterior wall. So in a study of 1,000 patients uh, from the Middle East, the mean BMI was 33.3 uh, kg per meter square. And the average number of suture applied was 4.2 minutes. And it's a fairly quick procedure requiring around one hour. And we can see that at 18 months, there was 15% of total body weight loss. And there was significant improvement in the diabetes, hypertension, and the dyslipidemia. And Many of these patients can have nausea and the abdominal pain during the first seven days, which is easily, easily controllable with the painkillers and the PPI. And out of 1,000 patients, only eight had the severe pain, and out of eight, three required the ESG removal. Bleeding is rare. Again, it can be easily controlled. Four patients had the perigastric collection, which may require drainage. So we can see out of 1,000 patients, only 24 had the complication, and they require the readmission. So it's a fairly safe procedure and we can see the effect on the uh, diabetes so out of 17 diabetic 13 had the complete remission and four had the partial resolution and similarly for the hypertension all 28 patients had a improvement uh, had the complete remission of hypertension and similarly for dyslipidemia there was significant improvement and complete resolution for dyslipidemia also so if you compare ESG endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty uh, with the balloon in a retrospective study, the uh, we can see that there was higher weight loss in ESG group as compared to the balloon. At one year, the weight loss in ESG group was 21% and 14% in the balloon group. And there were more serious adverse events in the intragastric balloon. In this group, more patient had the pain and more patient had the reflux. And uh, we can see that uh, in the uh, patient with the ESG, there was higher weight loss after the ESG as compared to intragastric balloon placement. Similarly, 
if we compare lab sleeve gastrectomy with the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty at 6 months there was higher weight loss in the laparoscopic group as compared to the esg group in esg group there was weight loss of 17% and but in the laparoscopic group the weight loss was 24% but there were lower rate of complication in the esg so esg is safer than the laparoscopic group but it leads to lesser weight loss as compared to surgery and now coming to the other intervention let's a small bowel intervention so it has been seen that if we compare lap sleeve gastroplasty with the uh, gastric bypass the weight loss is higher in the uh, bypass if we create a gastro jejunostomy this patient will have higher weight loss as compared to laparoscopic sleeve gastroplasty and patient with the gj gastro jejunostomy has a significant improvement in the diabetes so it has been seen that if food doesn't comes in contact with the duodenum there can be significant improvement in the diabetes so the small bowel intervention may be an effective treatment for the diabetes so there are two treatments one is the endo barrier and another is the duodenal mucosal resurfacing in duodenal endo barrier we place a sheath across the uh, duodenum and the proximal jejunum and the food goes through the sleeve and it can lead to the significant improvement in the diabetes so if the food doesn't comes in contact with the duodenum this can lead to the significant improvement in diabetes and similarly with the duodenal mucosal resurfacing we first do the duodenal mucosal ablation in diabetic patient we do the duodenal mucosal ablation and then mucosa regrows and this can again lead to improvement in the diabetes so uh, the endo barrier is a 16 cm long teflon coated sheath and it has a barbs it has a spikes at the proximal end which will fix the sheath to the stomach and uh, in a study of in a meta analysis of 412 patients it was seen that mean weight loss was 11 kg with the endo barrier and the hba1c reduction was 1.3 and but it comes with the severe complication so with the endo barrier 15% of patient they had the serious complication they had acute there were acute pancreatitis there were liver abscess sleeve obstruction and the gi bleed so it still Uh, uh, it, it can has a uh, so it went out of practice because of severe complications. Another technique is the duodenal mucosal resurfacing. So what we do first we localize the papilla, we go beyond the papilla, then we inject the saline in the submucosal layer. We just want to ablate the mucosal layer with the saline injection. We will be protecting the underlying muscularis propria. So then we pass a two centimeter long balloon over the guide wire, and the balloon is filled with the heated water and this will lead to the mucosal ablation and this can lead to improvement in the glycemic control so here uh, this uh, uh, that's a normal mucosa and this is mucosa after the ablation ablation with the hot water balloon and this is the uh, mucosa which has regrown after 3 months and uh, in a study uh, it was seen that uh after the mucosal ablation with at 90 degree centigrade there was significant improvement in the hb1ac by 0.9 and we can see that there is significant reduction in the hb1ac and there is also increase in the alt which is a parameter for the inflammation in the liver in patient with the fatty liver many patient with the obesity they also have fatty liver so with the duodenal mucosal resurfacing there will be control of diabetes there will be reduction in the level of insulin and this will also control the fatty liver so to summarize uh, prevalence of obesity and the complication is increasing we know surgery has the maximum efficacy but it has limited acceptance because of complication bariatric endoscopy can play a very crucial role in the obese patients and it has i think higher acceptance for the family intragastric balloon and the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty are the mainstay of treatment esg is safer than the surgery but has a, a lower weight loss as compared to surgery esg is more efficacious than the intragastric balloon with the lesser complication and small bowel intervention may be the future for the control of diabetes thank you very much for your patient hearing
yeah i i i will fully agree with you uh, that the weight loss is definitely lesser with the uh, uh, endoscopy compared to the bariatric surgery so surgery remains the gold standard treatment for the uh, weight loss okay so this treatment is when uh, is when the patient refuse there are two indication when the patient refuses the treatment by surgery then we can offer the patient the a bariatric endoscopy and second where the desired weight loss is only 10 to 20% there are few conditions like patient is uh, diabetic on insulin and they want to stop insulin if i have a 90 kg patient okay and patient is taking insulin daily if i reduce the weight only by 10 kg there will be significant improvement in the diabetes patient will be off insulin and similarly patient with the osteoarthritis patient with the obstructive sleep apnea so even with the 10 kg of weight reduction this will be efficacious this is not meant for the patient who has very high bmi okay so up to 90 100 kg patient who have benefit after losing 10 to 20 kg we can offer these patient the treatment yes surgery remains a gold standard surgery remains a first treatment so this is the treatment for the patient who refuses surgery or where only 10 kg of weight reduction uh, is is sufficient for the patient like i have many patient in my opd uh, who are 90 to 100 kg they have significant fatty liver they have osteoarthritis they have uh, diabetes so if we are able to we are able to reduce the weight by 10 kg they will have significant improvement i had a patient with a child day cirrhosis we placed a balloon now uh, 3 month back the patient was on insulin the patient lost around 15 kg with the balloon but that 15 kg uh, helped the, helped the patient in stopping the insulin she is of uh, hypoglycemic agents and there is significant improvement in the liver parameter also so there is very limited indications for the endobariatric it's not for the all patients and regarding complication also i agree that the complication of uh, bariatric surgery has reduced tremendously uh, in that i think in that retrospective study the more complication in lsg group was mainly due to grd the reflux rate was higher in the uh, lsg group as compared to esg group endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty and regarding cost effective uh, uh, i i can't comment on that but yes i think the cost is the cost of esg is comparable to lsg in a given patient right so uh, when we talk because this is the program for the general practitioners and we are actually addressing what the general practitioners have to take home with us So, yes. like when they have to refer such patients to us, in the case, so they have to give, they have to have a clear, clear idea what they give actually to their respective patients. In yes. uh, places like Kanpur and Uttar Pradesh, where people actually 
they they are quite. I would not, not say that they can afford it, but again, they will be quite happy. Okay, the uh, bike is not bad. And ultimately, the cost is the biggest uh, factor that we have to look into. So when this these things come into play, so we definitely have to when there is a procedure which is as actually I would say. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. Dietary endoscopy and dietary uh, procedures, endoscopy procedures are here to stay, especially for the uh, low uh, uh, obese patients, especially of the range of around 28 to 32 or 33 BMI, maximum 35 BMI, with no, uh, with not much of comorbidities. It is definitely here to stay. But again, when giving, when then giving them the option, you know, you have, you have to only two to two lakh rupees to give, or two to two lakh rupees to give. So better offer them, I would say, uh, a more durable and a more, uh, I would say, cost-effective rate. But again, I totally agree with you, sir, and thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. Anything, any comments from you, sir? Just a wonderful talk, Dr. Vikas. I agree thank with you. Dr. Shivanshu, he is a surgeon, he is an aggressive surgeon. <laughs> Yeah. He will not accept the military endoscopy. <laughs> but not as endoscopic and as endoscopist, we okay. really are very happy to see the results of the sleeve gastroplasty. And uh, and we look forward to some wonderful results and wonderful talks from you in the future. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, we should work more as a team. It, it's not a competitive competitive approach, it's a more a team approach. Yes. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, hello. Welcome all. So, probably everybody is having the sound of the CSTA. No CSTA. Post lunch snack as well, and uh, we are having some good cup of tea and some snacks as well. So uh, we have some changes uh, scheduled. Dr. Mohan Ramchandani sir is probably having stuck up with some case, some emergency. So probably uh, Dr. Kedar Patil sir would be actually uh, coming from the third session to the second. And uh, let me introduce Dr. Kedar Patil. Uh, am I audible, sir? Okay, yeah, yeah, you are audible. Hello, sir. Good evening. Hi. Greetings from Kanpur. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for inviting. Thanks, I'm a Kanpur. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving your uh, most and valuable precious time and taking us your uh, time for us. And Dr. Jadar Patil is the only board certified uh, bariatric surgeon from Maharashtra and is a very dynamic, competent GI bariatric and onco surgeon. And uh, he has finished his uh, GI surgery at BNB and uh, as well as FNB minimal access surgery from Gen Hospital in Coimbatore. And he has attained fellowship in uh, colorectal and bariatric metabolic surgery from Taiwan and also in gastrointestinal onco surgery from Tata Memorial, Mumbai. At present, he is heading the Department of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery at Precise Clinic uh, Pune. And uh, he is the uh, peer, uh, peer reviewed uh, like, uh, 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 author and reviewer for so many journals, and he himself is a avid writer, written so many uh, peer reviewed uh, publications as well as written not many chapters. So, and he's also the life member of IMA, RC, ASI, OSI, and Pune Surgical Society, the Maharashtra State Indian Medical Associations, and he's uh, uh, received the uh, President's Appreciation Award for the Flood Relief Work done in Saki 2018. He, is present, he was the Assistant Secretary and the Joint Treasurer of IMA Pune and is currently the Executive Committee Member of Maharashtra State Chapter of ASI and is always as a other part from, uh, uh, other than the medical field, he is actively involved in cricket and other social welfare. We welcome you all, sir, and we look forward for your talk on uh, Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery Essentials. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Yeah. At the outset, uh, I thank IMA Kanpur for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, speak at this August uh, forum. I bring uh, greetings from IMA Pune. Uh, I'm uh, working in capacity as an Assistant Secretary in IMA Pune. 
we are a 5000 uh, registered members association and uh, we also are actively doing uh, cmes and uh, social activities uh, so uh, in that regard i find uh, this uh, uh, connecting link between uh, ima kanpur and ima pune with that uh, i would like to start uh, the lecture that has been assigned if uh, one could allow me to share my screen i would start the lecture host needs to allow me to share my screen <laughs> Uh, i'm getting a message saying host has disabled participant screen sharing i think in the settings that needs to be changed yeah now i can i can do that is my screen visible now yes sir yeah the topic assigned to me uh, is essentials of bariatric surgery uh, and metabolic surgery and uh, i was told i have 20 minutes for this lecture <clears throat> so i 10 minutes more sir yeah okay okay uh, so uh, in this brief time it's really difficult to concise a field or a stream which has become uh, increasingly popular these days but i'll try to do my uh, uh, best job with regards to this speaking about uh, the essentials <clears throat> uh first i would like to uh, inform that uh, my myself and dr shivanshu have been trained at the same center jam hospital in coimbatore which is considered to be the Uh, one of the uh, best centers in laparoscopy in india and i was also trained with dr huang uh, who happens to be a pioneer in bariatric surgery uh, amongst asian surgeons in taiwan so uh, when we are speaking bariatric and metabolic the uh, surgery may or may not be the same but the intention to treat is different so when a patient is coming to us asking for weight loss it means that the patient is coming for bariatric surgery but when the patient is coming asking a cure for his diabetes hypertension sleep apnea uh, or uh, obesity related diseases the intention to treat is to uh, correct the disorder then it is termed as metabolic surgery the indication slightly vary <clears throat> for bariatric the bmi is uh, cut off is about 32.5 with comorbidities and 37.5 without comorbidities and for metabolic surgery it is 27.5 and above with uncontrolled comorbidities so how do we decide which procedure i'll be telling uh, in details in a while but a person who has severe psychiatric illnesses uh, is abusing alcohol uh, is unwilling for an a lifestyle or diet or exercise uh, modification and habit or a person having active malignancy organ failure or portal hypertension these are uh, contraindications organ failure is a relative uh, uh, contraindication because sometimes uh, liver transplant patients or kidney transplant patients require if they are morbidly obese they require bariatric surgery before they undergo a transplant surgery this is one of the most important slides of my presentation uh, we all know that 
Indians or Asians are highly prone for uh, cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. So uh, WHO has set in different recommendations for Asian people where uh, 18.5 to 23 is considered to be normal. As against uh, Westerners, up to 25 is considered to be normal. 23 to 25.7 is considered to be overweight. And 27.5 above is considered to be as obese. So uh, a waist circumference of about 90 centimeters in males and 80 centimeters in females is obesity. Someone coming to an, uh, your OPD and asking what is an uh, ideal weight for me, there is a very simple calculation. Height in centimeters minus 100 is an ideal weight. Uh, a 10% deviation in this is acceptable. Our entire treatment and uh, uh, obesity management protocol is based on BMI. So uh, BMI, uh, one needs to know, it's uh, weight in kgs by height in meter square. You have uh, many apps available on mobile where you can check BMI. So uh, you need not consult anyone just by putting your height and weight in the app, you will get to know the BMI. And as I said in the previous slide, the indications for bariatric and metabolic surgery, you can instantly know that whether this patient fits in for a bariatric surgery or not. So why are we doing bariatric surgery? There's a very good paper published in NEGM in 2011. So uh, when we are doing diet and exercise, so this was a study done on 50 patients with only diet and exercise. And patients were put on a 10-week diet uh, weight loss program. So what they have seen is the levels of ghrelin, which is an appetite-stimulating hormone, the levels increase. So even if the person loses weight, the le le high levels of ghrelin remain static and the person continues to gain weight. So you must have seen that patients keep on losing weight and gaining weight in circles. So this happens more often in obese persons. So uh, this is the basis why bariatric surgery is done. And we are exactly treating this problem of uh, that people face in weight loss. So a five point increase in BMI is associated with a 30% increase in uh, mortality. Uh, at 30 and 35 uh, kgs per meter square, the survival is reduced by two to four years. And at 40, 45 uh, BMI, it's reduced by eight to 10 years, which is comparable to a smoking person. There is 40% uh, mortality increase, 60 to 90% for diabetic renal and hepatic mortality, 10% for neoplastic mortality, and 20% for respiratory. So all put together, it is not at all uh, healthy being obese. This needs to be imparted and informed to all the patients who are obese. When we say we see so many products being advertised on TV, newspapers, and other places, social media, that do this and you can lose your weight easily. It sounds music to ears, isn't it? But really speaking, there is nothing like this. Even with surgery, person, people have to take efforts to maintain that lost weight. So again, this is a concept that has to be informed to all the patients. A word about pharmacotherapy. When we say uh, easy weight loss, we equate it to pharmacotherapy. But let me tell you that only 5 to 10% weight loss is realistic with pharmacotherapy. So meaning if a person is 100 kgs, he may lose 5 to 10 kgs maximum with the best possible medical uh, treatment that we have. Some people people uh, don't lose more than 5% weight at three months, they need to stop or change the medicine. Again, this is important because we see patients taking Orlistat and Liraglutide and all uh, kinds of therapies for six to eight months with no effect. So uh, as a uh, family physician, one has to intervene at period of three months and guide them if they're not losing weight, they have to be directed to a, a bariatric physician or a surgeon. Just as we have so many antihypertensive drugs and so many anti-diabetic drugs and physicians choose wisely uh, depending on the situations and patient profile, uh, 
the that one specific drug which would suit the person maximum similarly we choose bariatric surgery amongst the all other uh, options which are available so what all things do we consider we generally get calls uh, asking uh, uh, whether we are doing sleeve surgery and the cost of it but it is not that simple it is not sleeve is not the only bariatric surgery we have to take into consideration the age bmi comorbidities whether the person has pre existing gerd his quality of life uh, diet compliance exercise compliance what will this person follow the diet and exercise protocol that has been told or assigned whether he is eating sweets or he is eating in volume his psychological factors whether this person will follow up whether he take will take the supplements whether the person who has been doing surgery has been doing it consistently where, where he has trained the setup where he is doing the surgery and of course i have taken cost as the last consideration because that is the least consideration or last consideration when we are trying to fit in the best possible surgery for the patient uh, this is an again and very easy and important uh, score that uh, you can do it on yourself i mean i mean patients wherein you can assess whether this person will be free of diabetes based on age the bmi c peptide levels this is an fasting test the and postprandial test that we can do generally fasting is sufficient and the duration of diabetes based on these four factors and with this score uh, family physicians can assess whether this person can be free of diabetes we do not urge all diabetics to undergo surgery but Uh, all patients who are being shifted from oral anti uh, hypoglycemic agents to insulin because of poor control of diabetes uh, family physician should intervene in this stage if the patient is obese please do consider referring these patients to bariatric surgeons for at least an opinion so that you are given them a chance at least because if the duration duration of diabetes is more than 8 years or 10 years the end organ uh, damage uh, retina heart kidneys peripheral nerves uh, it starts so reversing diabetes from that stage is very very difficult there is something known as an pancreatic burnout that will happen and person cannot lose weight uh, cannot reverse his diabetes so these are the hormonal responses that we see with bariatric surgery glp1 rises pyy rises ghrelin decreases and with the same context we have glp1 analogs you must you all must be aware for diabetes treatment so uh, bariatric surgery for long time was thought to be just restricting food and diverting food but it is not so now we know that there are neuro hormonal responses after bariatric surgery there is altered signaling to pancreas and liver and that is how comorbidities get controlled you also need to know the concept of excess weight loss a person is 5 uh, feet his ideal weight is 50 kg if he is 100 that 50 kg is, is his excess weight so we as bariatric surgeons from uh, the inception of this uh, surgery have been speaking in terms of excess weight loss so what we are looking at is 60 to 80 percent of excess weight loss that happens in all bariatric surgeries uh, so it it is to the tune of 35 to 40 kg if we are considering 50 kg uh, excess weight so bmi loss indicates ideal i mean that is a different parameter we generally do not consider that physicians consider total body weight loss on the other hand so what they speak is 5 to 10% of total body weight loss that happens with medicines so this concept and excess weight loss concepts are different we see far more weight loss with bariatric surgery so uh, coming to the most popular surgery that we have uh, the sleeve gastrectomy what we are doing is uh, we are reducing the size of the stomach this is the fundic area which produces ghrelin so uh, by reducing the size of the stomach and removing fundus even if the person eats less because the volume intake is restricted with the small size stomach the person won't feel hungry because there is no ghrelin which is secreted also the food that comes in the stomach is sent into the small intestine quickly and the beauty of the procedure is that since the antrum is preserved here iron calcium vitamin absorption continues to happen and the person may uh, 
be put on intermittent supplements uh, after one year. So we are looking at 60 to 80%, 70 to 80% weight loss, excess weight loss with this procedure. So uh, Barrett's esophagus is a relative contraindication, malignancy, liver cirrhosis, uh, portal hypertension, and alcohol abuse. These are contraindications for this procedure. There, there is something known as sleep plus procedures where uh, we are doing and sleep and we are adding and bypass to this procedure. Uh, it could be a loop a duodenojejunal bypass, a single anastomosis duodenoileal bypass with a transit bipartition or a loop bipartition. So when we want diabetes uh, remission, uh, we do these procedures uh, wherein we have to do something more than a sleep. So this is the uh, step when we do sleep plus procedures. So it is an intermediary uh, procedure uh, in between and sleeve and a bypass. So uh, this is an uh, sleep plus procedure that I routinely do a sleeve with a proximal jejunal bypass. Uh, this is an enhanced hormonal effect as I mentioned. And this was the paper which has presented at the our World Congress of uh, IFSO in Dubai. The results of sleeve gastrectomy are excellent. We see uh, 50 to 80 percent weight loss at six to eight years. We also have 10 to 15 years uh, of uh, published results. Uh, 68 percent of patients have remission at five years, meaning they are off medicines. There's a very famous trial by the name of Stampede, wherein diabetes remission uh, of HbA1c less than six percent was achieved. Uh, in a uh, good number of patients and it is far more superior compared to medical treatment. What we do is we supplement these patients with protein, vitamin, folic acid, zinc, iron, calcium and minor trace elements after surgery. Coming to the uh, second aspect of bariatric surgery, a gastric bypass is one when we are doing a small pouch of the stomach and we are attaching small intestine to this pouch and we are redoing a jejunojejunostomy so that the food from the esophagus goes into the small intestine. The acid pancreatic juices and bile mixes with food at this place and further digestion happens. So uh, this was a gold standard a few years ago, but sleeve being a more uh, simpler modification has picked up in large numbers recently. Mini gastric bypass, again, a quite popular surgery, especially in North India towards Punjab, Haryana, and uh, those states, because a person can eat uh, as much as he wants, but still he continues to lose weight. That's the beauty of this procedure. And uh, this is mini gastric bypass. It's a technical modification of uh, Rue NY gastric bypass. If time permits, I'll show you all a video of sleeve and mini gastric bypass. So uh, those who have done diet and exercise, but their BMI is between 27 to 32. We get a lot of unmarried females who are about to uh, be advised or into the process of marriage, but they are not losing weight. So these are ideal candidates where you do a non-surgical procedure. We insert an intragastric balloon, which is a silicon balloon filled with saline. This is adjustable or non-adjustable as per the company and costing. So this can help a person lose up to 10% of weight. And if medicines are added to it, one may go up to 15% of total body weight loss. So this is an alternative step uh, for patients who uh, don't want surgery and still want to lose about 10 to 15 kgs of uh, weight. Uh, and they are not able to lose with diet and exercise. We have enough data now worldwide uh, lakhs of surgeries are done every year and we have more than 10 to 15 years of results of uh, Rue Nova gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. <clears throat> 30 procedures is the learning curve for a, uh, any bariatric procedure. So these a number of uh, cases need to be done uh, by an individual surgeon uh, before he starts doing on his patient. So training at a 
good center is equally important. This surgery is covered by CJHS in India. The surgery is totally free. Pune Municipal Corporation, our corporation here locally covers this surgery. They pay up to uh, half of the amount of surgery. Uh, most of the insurance companies uh, have started covering this uh, surgery under insurance and IRDI, which, which is a uh, nodal body to cover the uh, insurance in India, has started covering this uh, surgery uh, under insurance. There is a finance option available those who cannot afford these surgeries. And the expenses of this surgery, those who have severe comorbidities and uh, medicines bills going into thousands of, thousands of rupees per month, they can cover these expenses within two years. Unfortunately, what we see as a common practice is people advise bariatric surgery uh, very at very late stages or when the patient is crippled for life. They have been suffering obesity throughout their life. They cannot move. They become dependent, uh, children are abroad, and then they come asking for bariatric surgery. But let me tell you, a obese person suffers from obesity lifelong. So it, uh, uh, family physician's rule is equally important to send these patients to a bariatric surgeon in right time so that they can enjoy their life uh, to the fullest and be free of diseases. Uh, family physicians definitely won't lose these patients if they get uh, rid of the diseases. In fact, they would be attached more since you are uh, curing, helping to cure them these diseases. And last but not the least, uh, a complete knowledge of this procedure is very, very important for the treating surgeon. Half a half week knowledge and just doing sleep gastrectomy is not the way out. A uh, person, a uh, bariatric physician or surgeon needs to have his own obesity support group where we conduct meetings every uh, two or three monthly uh, and tell them about diet, exercise and lifestyle modifications, uh, which are very important and also equally important after bariatric surgery. Also programs like these uh, a surgeon needs to conduct because this concept of bariatric surgery is still not acceptable to most people in India. But seeing uh, one who has undergone the surgery would definitely know the effects of this surgery. And, and that's the reason these kind of programs help in spreading the awareness about these surgeries. So this is an individualized surgery. One surgery cannot suit all and it has to be tailored according to the patient and situations. So you can get to see more videos and information on these social media platforms. And I thank you all once again for a patient listening. If I have some time, I would just like to briefly show one or two videos regarding this procedure. Do I have some time? Yes. No. yes. Sir, thank you yeah. so much. Uh, uh, first of all, I can yeah. thank you for, uh, for giving a very crisp information during this uh, 
Hello, Dasan. Yeah, yeah, I am there. I am listening. Yeah, yeah you want to present the video, sir? Yeah, if time uh, permits, I'll show yeah, just. Yeah, yeah, you have time. You can just go ahead. So this is a video of sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, what we are doing in sleeve gastric? This is la totally laparoscopic procedure. Uh, we insert uh, three to four ports uh, focusing on the upper abdomen. We retract the liver with various means. This is one of the means, uh, liver suspension tape technique. So this is the stomach. We are marking initially, whereas to uh, what site to cut. This is an energy device, Ligashwar, which helps in dissecting and sealing at the same time. You can see that it's cutting and sealing at the same time. So surgery becomes fast, bloodless, uh, and easy. So uh, this is an uh, energy device. You can see that the stomach has been freed completely of the greater curvature and the pancreatic adhesions have been removed. This is an 32 French bougie where, which is inserted orally. The uh, idea is to have a uniform sleeve in all patients. 32 French is a standard size. And then we transect with staplers. We have three rows of staplers on each side and the blade goes in between and cuts. So uh, we have a sealed uh, sleeve and we require about five to six firings from the antrum up to the left crust. Our fundus is completely removed. And then we fix this stomach tube to the retroperitoneum. And at the end, we remove the sleeve specimen and the suspension tape. So surgery usually takes about uh, an hour or so. And you can see with only three incisions, we can do this surgery. So this is a sleeve gastrectomy and uh, a small video about uh, mini gastric bypass, which is quite popular in North India so that you can get and just an idea of uh, uh, Shivanshu, I'm sorry, the other video is on the hard drive. Maybe. You can take it. Yeah. Uh, during this, do you usually not indicate the upper proximal side of the sleeve when you are doing the sutures? Pardon me. Do not, uh, don't you indicate or like uh, like uh, bury the sutures in the proximal side of the staple line? Ah, uh, actually, it is very subjective because uh, if the firing is good and uh, uh, firing is uh, adequately done, uh, you need not imbricate or do anything to the sleeve. But uh, if you feel that uh, the uh, firing has not been adequate, there has been some problem in firing, then it is a good idea to uh, oversee the upper one third of sleeve. We have with us Dr. Vivek also. My time the video is obtained, so we will not waste time. And Dr. Vivek is going to ask you a to his opinion on uh, the law of Dr. Vivek. Yeah, definitely. I am able to open the video. I will just show a brief video after uh, this question by Dr. Vivek. First of all, I would like to, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. First of all, I would like to thank you sir, for giving me time and uh, coming on time to share your news. Because it was not easy. Really, it is common in India, all India, so in the last year also, that the week is very predominant. And, uh, for the last couple of years, patients uh, are coming to us uh, with just more complaints of OSA or OSA. Uh, for the past five or six years, they are using right up of treatment, but still their symptoms are not present. A few years back, the genetic surgery or metabolic surgery was not very common in the surgery. But over the last few years, I have done this one. So, I hear the surgery. Sir, I am not. I am not able to hear the complete sentence. I just got to understand that you are mentioning that bariatric surgery 
was not common earlier and now it is being done that and osc is also quite common as what you are mentioning right in last couple of years people are uh, what we do is uh, if the person is having obstructive sleep apnea for which we do a sleep study pre operatively uh, if the uh, hi index is more than 15 we advise them a pulmonologist opinion uh, and we start them on cpap preferably but if it is severe sometimes they do require bipap this cpap or bipap we continue to uh, use before surgery during surgery i mean uh, immediate post op period and after surgery for 3 months um with, uh, by 3 months they lose about 25% of their excess weight so uh, after that we reassess with the repeat uh, sleep study uh, whether the osa has reduced and if it has reduced with an pulmonologist opinion again we uh, try to take them off uh, cpap or bipap so they, generally they do not require cpap or bipap beyond 6 months that is what we have seen so more than that is there any immediate complication No, no. Uh, earlier there was a fear among surgeons that uh, uh, this might uh, lead to leaks in sleeve or bypass, but there have been enough a number of publications which say that there is no increased risk. But for a sleeve, sometimes we do keep an rails tube uh, because the machine is pumping uh, air. and we don't want the sleep to uh, this uh, cause discomfort to the patient so we keep an rails tube which is open so uh, that is a modification that we do if you are giving it immediately post op thank you thank you sir can the machine to reduce it yes thank you sir yeah i'll just uh, make it very brief and just to give an idea what is an bypass so uh, again this is a different kind of energy device harmonic with which again you can see that it's cutting the tissues and sealing at the same time so this is the lesser curvature of the stomach we are at the crow's foot and uh, we are trying to make an window for our stapler to go in and for our first fire this is an mini gastric bypass so once you can see that the window has been opened and it's been created now the first firing will come from the right hand port so this is the first firing there are different color codes for different kind of staplers and this uh, coding helps in transaction uh, at appropriate thickness at appropriate sides so this is the first firing this would be the second firing and then on with an buji in place acting as a guide we create a stomach tube it's an pouch actually if you see we have come like this horizontally and we are going up so with sequential firings we keep on completing the pouch so a pouch has been created of, out of the stomach this is the remnant stomach this is the pouch of the mini gastric bypass this is a stomach pouch now there is an enterotomy that has been created so that the small intestine will come and be attached here so about 150 cm from the dg flexure we take up the small intestine we create an enterotomy put in an stapler inside the small intestine and inside the stomach and with this stapler firing these two parts unite together so you can see with the firing now the small intestine and stomach have become one we are checking for bleeding right now and once this is done we start closing with an absorbable suture 
so this is with suturing we close the defect completely and once this is complete we can see that this is the below pancreatic limb the food will come from the pouch it will go into the small intestine here like this and the, from the below pancreatic limb the bile and pancreatic juice will come mix with the food and go down so it's an restructuring this is the below pancreatic limb it will mix with the food and it will go down so this is mini gastric bypass we do a leak test in the end to make sure that there is no leak of methylene blue so uh, this is mini gastric bypass sir thank you so much again for your dedication and as we have told that we have basically touched upon all the indications for indications and the types of surgeries which you are performing and the surgeries which are performed all over the world and thank you again for your precious time and thank you dr vivek and everybody here in this city for uh, uh, and we all thank you sir and we always look forward to having you soon back in camp thank you so thank much thank you thank you very much shivanshu and uh... best wishes uh, for your new center and uh, we all know that you are doing great work with the videos that you share in our surgical groups definitely i am sure that uh, kanpur has been blessed with a well trained uh, uh, bariatric and advanced laparoscopic surgeon uh, my best wishes to your center and to you thank you sir thanks sir thank you we will be saying a special thanks to you for opening your lecture and very graciously yes you for coming online Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your gesture for the coming up the the delay that those of the Mohan Lal Chandani had was very uh, busy with the medical procedure and things. So thank you once again for being a part of this CGP. It was a pleasure to be. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you also. This we we end this session of uh, the CGP. Uh, we are we are now proceeding to the final session of today. Another very interesting session which will be a great interest to all of us. Uh, this is a session which will be uh, the program director is Dr. Ramachandran, who is an eminent gastroenterologist uh, uh, in the city. We have been on this work for the last uh, few years, and uh, for this we have Dr. Mohan Ramachandran, who is a member of the Surya Foundation, who is a member of the Surya Foundation. Uh, who will be talking about the full scope of the process for the gastric process? So, over to you, Dr. Bharat Chandra, to come to this session. Good evening, my name is Bharat. So, Dr. Bharat Chandra, my name is Bharat Chandra. I'm the members of this and director of intervention members to be at AIG. He has made many worldwide from Japan, from China. And he is a master of advanced endoscopic procedures like the space endoscopy, spiral endoscopy, and yes, CT, yes. And uh, he's uh, live faculty at various endoscopic conferences. He is a member of all the major societies of the world and India. And he has numerous publications. So I will hand over the mic to Dr. Mohan Ramchandran to. Uh, at the outset, I thank uh, Goro for giving me this wonderful opportunity, and uh, my topic is uh, approach to jaundice. I'll just ask a host because they have disabled me from screen sharing. So, could you please enable it so that I can show my slides? so i'll be speaking about uh, obstructive jaundice and there has been lot of imp improvement in management of obstructive jaundice not only the various stents and uh, other thing but also uh, the diagnostic ability of uh, gastroenterologist has improved tremendously so i'll sp start with uh, the jaundice itself and uh, as you know obstructive jaundice forms a uh, uh, small part of total jaundice and jaundice as we all know is a symptom it is not the disease and uh, there has to be some cause of it 
so the cause can be excessive breakage of blood or there can be a hepatocellular jaundice or there can be inadequate drainage so one has to go into the uh, basics and one should understand that bilirubin is produced by heme and heme is 80% of heme is in hemoglobin other heme containing proteins are myoglobin and other hemoproteins and this heme is broken down to bilirubin in the macrophage of reticuloendothelial system and once this bilirubin is released into the blood stream it goes is in always unconjugated bilirubin and then it combines with albumin and it is transported to the liver hepatocyte so in hepatocyte there is only uh, one function is that it gets conjugated to glucuronic acid by glucuronyl transferase enzyme and then it becomes conjugated and soluble bilirubin once it becomes soluble it is secreted into the biliary canaliculi and here is the role of obstructive jaundice that if there is a blockage here then the bilirubin will rise because it cannot be secreted into small intestine and subsequent steps of the bilirubin being uh, digested by bacterial proteases to form urobilinogen will not happen and the urobilinogen as you know gives the color of the feces and uh, majority of the obstructive jaundice you will say the pale feces because there is no if the if the jaundice is jaundice is because of obstruction the feces become pale and urobilinogen which is reabsorbed and goes into kidney is also not secreted so once you see the lft you will know that you are you are you are dealing with obstructive jaundice because there will be absent urobilinogen and then will be high alkaline phosphatase and the stool color becomes pale and then this is the predominant lft once you see a high conjugated bilirubin normal ast lt high alkaline phosphatase absent urobilinogen in the lft or urine you will say that you are dealing with obstructive jaundice once you see this a patient who has obstructive jaundice that is the one uh, alarm thing that because the cause of obstruction can sometime be life threatening and one has to investigate further as i told jaundice is a symptom and we have to go into the depth now we have classified this jaundice as obstructive but this is not enough we should see where is the obstruction and uh, once you see the obstruction obstructive pattern of lft you immediately do an ultrasound if you do an ultrasound you will see the dilated biliary ductal system and have a rough estimate of where is the obstruction you can see this is dilated intrahepatic biliary ductal system and you will say that now i am dealing with obstructive jaundice and once the obstructive jaundice is seen one has to do a detailed investigation in the form of a ct scan to know the cause of the jaundice whether it's a tumor whether the tumor or there is a stone or then we may do the staging of the tumor and see so on and so forth so i will say that start with ultrasound and go to ct scan and sometimes you may be required to do mrcp to know the cause of obstruction we'll go to the more details of this and uh, as a gastroenterologist if you if you see an ultrasound showing cbd stone the 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 treatment is straight forward because you will go with the ercp and do a sphincterotomy you can see this is obstruction is because of stone we have found out the obstruction is because of stone and the once stones are formed you have to do an endoscopic sphincterotomy remove the stone the stones can be big or small the majority of the stone will come out with sphincterotomy and balloon or a basket but sometime it may require further investigations or treatment we'll discuss later so once you see a, a biliary obstruction a gastroenterologist perspective i will see three things what is the diagnosis 
why the obstruction what is the level of obstruction that will be told to you by some of that cross sectional imaging but also i would like to go into more details whether this patient requires surgery or not will depend on the diagnosis and cross sectional imaging if the diagnosis is malignant and the tumor is operable this patient goes to surgeons directly and we get rid of the tumor but if cross sectional imaging is saying this is not treatable or uh, curative then comes uh, the role of gastroenterologist in palliation we also will discuss about what are the adjuvant treatment which we can give and increase the span of life of the patient so let us discuss about endoscopic diagnosis because diagnosis is the most important we want a differentiation of malignant versus benign what benign we have to go into the depth so if you see a tumor on the ct scan you will say that this this patient may have a mass which requires fnac because this patient will have a good access to uh, tumor only by uh, endoscopic ultrasound so endoscopic ultrasound is a, a method where we go near the tumor and take the breast cytology or take the fine needle aspiration cytology or if there is no tumor and the and the obstruction is proximal we do ercp so if the tumor is present and it is lower down we choose to do eus and eus is nothing but a probe attached to the end of the endoscope and it goes very near to the level of obstruction in this you can see a stone it has got a 100% sensitivity and 95 97% specificity to identify the cause of obstruction say for example this patient has come to us with jaundice and you do an endoscopic ultrasound you will see here there are stones over there and this patient we know now the cause of jaundice is stones and this patient goes for ercp while well, once you do an eus in such type of patient a patient of chronic pancreatitis has come to with, with obstruction of the biliary system and you can see a tumor over there and this tumor needs to be known the cost should be known so you can do eus guided fnac that's a fnac being done from there and then you will straight away know know the diagnosis eus also helps us in local staging whether the it is infiltrating into superior mesenteric artery or portal vein which makes this tumor inoperable or it has got liver metastasis so not only you can do a eus guided fine needle aspiration cytology but also do assess the operability of the patient so once you see a jaundice you you have zero down to obstruction you have to go to the test especially eus depending upon the clinical presentation of the patient so these are the two typical examination where eus will help but suppose there is no mass and patient has obstruction then you will require two thing one to relieve the obstruction because patient has intractable itching he is having fever or then there is a uh, obstruction which needs to be assessed why the obstruction and in such situation you will do an ercp ercp the good thing is that you will be able to bypass that obstruction take the breast cytology and put stent but our diagnosis should not and there we need more details of why this obstruction is happening and most of the ercp will look like same even if it is cancer even it is post operative injury or even it is uh, inflammatory diseases like igg4 cholangiopathy or uh, any infective pathologies like tuberculosis or hiv so they will look same so what to do you need to have a uh, tissue because this obstruction may be of different etiology and you can see here once you taken proper tissue the left hand panel was cholangiocarcinoma which required surgery or right hand panel is showing tuberculosis because of the nodes there was an obstruction over there led to 
and uh, obstruction of the biliary system patient will present to you with jaundice and you have to pinpoint the cause of jaundice so once you do ercp you are still struggling with the etiology and once you struggle with etiology you know that you are dealing with indeterminate biliary stricture during ercp we pass a brush to take cytology and also pass biopsy forceps to take biopsies from those strictures but still our success of taking correct diagnosis is only 40% with or maximum 56% that is why the new uh, systems have been developed which can uh, these are the cholangioscopy system which can go inside the bile duct and tell us the true story like say for this example this patient has obstructive jaundice and you are doing a cholangioscopy cholangioscopy is endoscopy of duct bile duct you can see a cholangioscope is being passed after doing papillotomy inside the bile duct and you can see here we are reaching to the area of obstruction this is the biliary obstruction area and then you can see here lot of Uh, infiltration and the uh, narrow band imaging when the special type of imaging where you pass uh, the narrow spectrum of light limited to blue light and you can see clearly that these these are the tumor vessels and once you see such type of picture you know that you are dealing with cancer and you can take the guided biopsies also so cholangioscopy not only tells you about the level of obstruction the extent of obstruction but also will give you a good vision as you can see here as we go intrahepatically there are no obstruction inside and similarly there, again there is a mass in the mid cbd and this is showing a tumor and this is cholangiocarcinoma patient will present with obstructive jaundice and you do a ercp similar stricture but i am just reiterating the fact that why it is important sometimes to go into the very detail of diagnosis and what gastroenterologists can offer and you can see this obstruction is because of extrinsic compression and then there is a pus coming out so there is a, a node beside the bile duct which has ruptured into the biliary system and this is tuberculosis you can see here this is tuberculosis and was diagnosed only after histopathology similar patient you can see here there is again obstruction and that uh, uh, there are no tumor vessels in the stricture this only nodularity and no tumor vessels again typical of tuberculosis obstructive jaundice patient has stricture you do a cholangioscopy you find again a mass but here you can take a targeted biopsy because we are not only interested in knowing whether it's benign or malignant but also what type of malignant all malignant disease will have not same treatment like in cholangiocarcinoma which is operable will definitely improve with surgery while in this patient the obstruction is there because of a malignant mass but it is lymphoma and lymphoma are very well treatable without surgery by doing a, a, a chemo radiotherapy or putting a temporary stent for some time so that is why it is important for us to know the cause of jaundice and as you have seen similar presentation similar ercp finding all three different diagnoses all three requiring different treatment all three curable with different and as i told uh, initially also the cbd stones which may sometimes be very large and they cannot be removed you can do a cholangioscopy guided laser lithotripsy or a ehl electrohydraulic lithotripsy and as you can see the stone can be pulverized broken down into small fragments and subsequently these broken stones are removed so the cholangioscopy has brought paradigm shift in management of obstructive jaundice where it allows us to go inside the bile duct interrogate a stricture take targeted biopsy helps us in management of larger stone breaking them pulverizing them
another method of studying the structure is to do confocal endomicroscopy this is nothing but a real time histology you can see the biliary epithelium will look like a leash of capillary network but as the tumor grows as the malignant cancer grows these blood vessels becomes thick and more branched and you can pick up these uh, uh, confocal endomicroscopy images by passing a probe from the ERCP scope into the bile duct and further study this uh, structure and that help us in diagnosing whether we are dealing with malignant or benign structure so that was about what are the recent advantage advances in endoscopic diagnosis once you saw a tumor you have seen that this patient is not operable you will definitely say that this patient needs palliation reduction in jaundice uh, tissue diagnosis and send this patient for a palliative chemo radiotherapy but before that have a very good knowledge about the level of obstruction the bismuth classification whether there is any atrophied node whether the portal vein or hepatic artery is involved whether there is an abnormal anatomy after studying the trans abdominal scanning you can do various type of stenting especially in malignant case so there are many questions which needs to be answered whether you require a bilateral or a unilateral whether plastic stent is enough or a metal stent and metal stent also come up with many and you can see here the the biliary palliation can be done by plastic or even for a metal stents but now the dictum is if the patient is having a malignant jaundice majority of the patients are offered metal stent because the probability of non obstruction remains much better with metal stent as compared to plastic stent and metal stent placement is the most effective treatment of inoperable malignancy especially common bile duct structure placement of metal stent is cost effective because if you put a plastic stent patient may come to you again and again with recurrent cholangitis and you may end up doing many ercp as compared to one ercp in a patient who has limited life span uh, because they already have uh metastatic or inoperable cancers uh this is regarding going more detail we can not only put a uh, one stent but also multiple stent at one uh, the aim is to drain more than 50% of the liver and if you drain more than 50% of the liver your jaundice palliation is much better the rate of cholangitis is much lower and overall survival improved because these patients are not coming to you for again again ERCP we also take help of MRCP to say whether the tumor is type 1 or whether it has already involved the bifurcation and left and right systems are separate to say that it is type 2 or it has gone to the secondary radicals on the right side or left side uh, defining them into type 3 or 4 structures and then decide majority of the patient who have up till type 3 uh, biliary structures we offer endoscopic treatment as a gastroenterologist but if there is there are too much of uh, spread of tumors to the secondary and tertiary level we either uh, advise them as best supportive care or refer for interventional radiology guided uh, insertion of stent percutaneously i'll just skip in these slides because if you have a type 1 structure you put one stent and if you have a, even if you have a type 2 structure we basically see whether the left system is involved which drains 30% and then also define the right anatomy to right anterior system or right posterior system all drain 30% and as i told we need to drain at least 50% so if you if your right anterior and posterior system are communicating even putting one stent on right side will serve the purpose while if you are dealing with a type 3a structure where all the ductal systems are separated you need to put at least two stents 
either one stent in left and right anterior system or two stents in right anterior and posterior system. So that is how we decide about the stents. Uh, regarding benign biliary stricture, sometimes the stricture can not be, uh, you know, can also be benign, especially uh, there are three types of benign stricture. One is chronic pancreatitis related lower CBD stricture. Second is post-operative like golf bladder surgery induced uh, ischemic injury or uh, uh, placement of clips, inadvertent placement of clips on the bile duct. This uh, also can cause obstructive jaundice. Moreover, now we are seeing more post liver transplantation, benign biliary stricture, especially anastomotic site. So these three are benign biliary strictures. And these can also be treated by placement of stents. But here we cannot put uncovered stent. We either have to put covered stent which are removable or aggressively treat these tumors or the strictures by placement of multiple plastic stents. Idea is to dilate the stricture by sequential placement of multiple stent and keep it dilated for long time. And this, this an example, you can see there are five stents which have been placed, a 10 French five stent placed across a stricture for one year and that will cause permanent dilatation of that stricture and you can get rid of uh, a major surgery. Similarly, uh, the strictures which are away from the bifurcation or away from the cystic duct insertion, you can put fully covered stent. In fact, we published a recent trial in a very high index journal, Gastroenterology, showing that the placement of multiple plastic stent and fully covered stent are having a long-term su success in, in the tune of 75 to two third of patient may improve. And if you put a fully covered stent, you may require less number of ERCP as compared to plastic stent, which requires every three month patient to visit to hospital, get an extra stent or two, till it gets dilated to your uh, expectation. So this was about the endoscopic treatment of biliary strictures. What about the adjuvant therapy? We can now also provide these strictures because these patients, even after placement of stent, ultimately will present to you with recurrent cholangitis, obstruction, and they may not survive the episode of cholangitis. So idea is to prevent the obstruction of these stent. And you can do this by many methods, brachytherapy, radioactive stents, photodynamic therapy, radio frequency ablation. Out of this, gastroenterologists are more comfortable because photodynamic therapy has got a lot of toxicities. Brachytherapy is not standardized. Uh, radio frequency ablation is a very simple device. It's like a 10 French catheter. Uh, which can pass through these strictures. You can see here, you, you, you can see this uh, tumorous stricture over there. And once you pass this uh, catheter, which burns that stricture, that radio frequency ablation can ablate these strictures and cause opening of the stricture. And after that, if you place a stent, the stent occlusion rate comes down the overall mortality is reduced and also the quality of life improves. You can see this is a tight structure, pre-radio frequency ablation cholangioscopy picture, post-radio frequency ablation, the structure has completely opened and tumor has burned. And now if you put stent, that will not get occluded very early. And this may increase the overall survival rate. The role of endoscopist or gastroenterologist in obstructive jaundice also comes up when you are dealing with patients who have acute cholangitis. And one has to be very, very cautious if a patient comes to you with pain, fever, and jaundice. Whenever you see a patient who has pain, who has high fever, and has jaundice, you should start thinking about cholangitis. Acute cholangitis, the treatment is not only dilate, uh, directed by the uh, 
systemic antibiotic therapy, but also biliary drainage procedure is most important. Unless you drain this system, most of the antibiotics which you give are going to fail. And as you can see here, this patient who has already metal stent has presented to us with cholangitis. And in such cases, you need to reduce uh, the, the, the obstruction. Similarly, you can see these patients present to you with obstructive jaundice, acute gallstone pancreatitis with cholangitis. In such cases, you need to do an immediate urgent ERCP. And you can see there is an impacted stone at ampulla, which has, which has caused a gallstone pancreatitis. And moment you remove the stone, there is gush of pus, which is deposited behind this stone. And unless you remove this, these are very rewarding patients. This patient, unless treated uh, with the ERCP and decompression, may not survive even after uh, giving a very good antibiotic coverage. Biliary ascariasis sometimes get stuck into the bile duct and patient may present to you with acute cholangitis. And in such cases also, removal of these worms out of the bile duct is important because that will prevent the cholangitis. Patients sometimes present to us with hydratis cyst getting stuck. And these are the patients who benefit by a quick decompression, by nasobiliary drainage. As you can see, there is a stone. Patient has acute cholangitis. One need to put uh, just drainage, nasobiliary drainage, and uh, the patient gets all right. Okay, okay, okay. So this is a typical case of obstruction, as I told. This is my last slide, and uh, gastroenterologist definitely forms uh, one of the important uh, aspect. But obstructive jaundice needs a team approach, multi-modality approach. Gastroenterologist will be uh, yeah. very helpful in diagnosing and also staging of the disease. Uh, the interventional radiologist may help us in uh, pro properly palliating the, uh, the blockage. Surgeons may come up and do the surgery to remove the tumor completely and do bilioentric anastomosis. Oncologist will be called for uh, palliative radio, uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy. I think with this, I'll end my talk, Gaurav. Uh, as a gastroenterologist, we have many things to do, but we alone can't win the battle. We need to have a team approach to, to tackle this uh, a problem. Thank you very much for your patience here. Dr. Mohan, are you able to hear me? Yeah, very faintly, Gaurav, your voice is not that clear. OK, sir. Uh... With uh, me, sir, and Dr. Shivanshu Vishal is there in the panel, and Dr. Fuse Fisher, gastroenterologist, is there in panel. So, would ask them to come in and ask any questions. Good evening, sir. Wonderful talk, as always. Thank you. It's a pleasure, pleasure listening to you, sir. Uh, just a, a brief question regarding the use of uh, uh, the spyglass modality, sir. Uh, how cost effective are you finding it in? Uh, 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 do you advise us in our clinical day-to-day -day practice, sir? Uh, will, will it be cost effective to uh, be using it regularly, sir? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. Actually, we did a randomized control trial in our institute where we did first ERCP using spyglass cholangioscopy, say for a stricture. And in other arm, we did a conventional ERCP. So in conventional ERCP, the, the, we are looking for total cure of patient. So once you see a stricture, you do a breast cytology and you put a stent. And after some time, patient comes back with negative report. So neither you have confirmed the diagnosis nor you have refuted the diagnosis. So you remove the stent, do another cytology. So that will cause multiple visits to the patients and ultimately it increase the cost. Now, if you go with spyglass type of a system, which gives you much more pinpoint diagnosis, much more targeted biopsies, you can reduce overall cost. So 
definitely if a modality which gives you a better diagnosis ultimately though the index cost must be high but overall cost reduces thank you thank you sir for the excellent presentation and dr shivanshu yes shivanshu thank you thank you we all should go with it as a team of work and again gastro medical and the gastro surgical team and so this is the message that we have to convey to the ima uh, general practitioner that is why uh, that is what the essence of this meeting is and uh, so we as a team can do wonders and uh, nothing nobody is just uh, can stand alone so thank yeah. you once again for being here i totally agree with you. Finally, sir, I think uh, we can uh, do a good diagnosis and management. Our role is very important in managing obstetric journeys and the team work of oncologists, surgeon, I think, or patient. Yes. So, greetings uh, from Kanpur, sir, for such a lucid and clear lecture. And, uh, thank you so much, Gaurav, for your kind invitation and thank everybody. Sir. Thank you. Sir, on behalf of the team on ABCGP, Kanpur branch, we extend a warm thanks and for you to have spared your time. We know you are extremely busy for the taking care of the institute. But we are extremely thankful for this presentation that you have written our audience with. Actually, this whole talk will be recorded on YouTube. I would be able to watch the video on the last one. I think we can only talk about this. This thank you once again for the very good day. Thank you for the thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about.